this, uh, this next session is going to be anything could happen. Uh, I've got, I've just got a few, few um, housekeeping notices and things first. Um, actually, I'd like to introduce Josh Bailey all the way from Wellington. Woohoo! Yeah. Google Australia Task Force, Google New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. Google Aotearoa. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so Josh works at the Google Aotearoa branch. Uh, Josh is the Google Aotearoa branch. But, <laughs> but from small things, great things grow. And uh, so, um, as, as you're paying, not paying people, as you're well aware, um, Google has sponsored this entire two days, which is extremely generous. And I know a number of you have said, how can we thank Google? Well, one thing you can do is give Josh a hug on your way out. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you'll pass that on to his colleagues in Australia, as you will sit in the to organise this. Um, but the other way is that at the end of today, we're going to do an online survey. We'll go up into the lab and get a survey, what was good, what was bad, all that sort of stuff. Um, but there is a button in there that says, um, you know, would you come back to this or something, and would you recommend this? Um, you can put what you want there, but that's what I'm going to pass back to Google. And so if you think we should do it again, we click on the do it again button. Um, and, and, and especially just please do the survey so that we, I've got evidence to pass on to Google that it's worthwhile. Um, and, but, but part of the CH, CS Radius thing is that Google sent us a real engineer to talk to, talk to us about what, what they're up to as well. So thanks for coming down to that, Josh. And of course, he'll be around for the, for the day. Um, can you head back what time? Uh, Okay, late tonight. So we'll be around at dinner and stuff as well. Um, so, you know, um, quiz are asking what's like, what sort of students you should be sending, whatever you, whatever you want to know about uh, life at Google. Um, other things to know about um, over lunch, um, the, there's going to be a demonstration of the, the T bots, the robots that I was talking about. So, look out for that. Um, you know, going to set them up especially, so be good to go and check that out and um, just be in the lunch area. Um, for those who need fresh air and exercise uh, over lunch, um, uh, we've, we've got a garden outside with the Seven Bridges Garden. Has anyone used our Seven Bridges Garden? Yeah, so when I get a hundred kids in here, and it's all getting a bit much for me, um, we've got this garden outside, um, it's just, just right outside the main entrance there, with Seven Bridges in it, and it's the classic Seven Bridges problem, from, which computer scientists say is, a, is theirs, and mathematicians say is theirs, but it's really a computer science problem. And, and the, challenge, <laughs> the, the challenge is to find a way to cross every bridge exactly once. And, um, and you're not allowed to go around the ends because you, there's an imaginary river flowing through the whole thing. Um, if you go to have a colleague who knows about the seven bridges problem, they can explain it. And um, usually when I bring take a task of primary school kids out there, they just go bananas running around in circles and that. And it's absolutely perfect and they come back and hear it's all just so if you, if you need some exercise, then that's a great way to get it, intellectual exercise as well as physical exercise. Um, one other quick thing, um, apparently a couple of people said they wouldn't mind a bit of a tour around town at some stage, because um, some of you went on Sunday, I think, Steve got here. Um, after dinner tonight, there's no particular plans, and we've got two bands available. So if anyone wants to kind of brace themselves and see some of the amazing stuff that's happened around here over the last year, um, both exciting and depressing and hopeful and some glasses half full and some glasses half empty there, um, we'd be happy to take you for a bit of a drive into the downtown area. Um, actually, Judith, my wife, said we should take some people over to the east side as well and you know, show, um, show you what some real sand looks like. You know. um, so, uh, um, we'll, we'll organise that over dinner, but if you haven't got plans for the evening, um, Steve might run an airport run, but if I get one more driver, we've got two vans and we can uh, run something there. Um, this session, uh, so one of the neat things about computer science is that if, if everything's ever quiet in the tea room, all you need to do is say, I think Java is a great first programming language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, or, I think Python is a great language, or something like that, and you're sorted for the next three hours. Um, we've only got one hour, but I thought I would give... I've called this the soapbox, and we've got a few volunteers. Um, I can't remember who they are, but we'll find out. Maybe someone else will want to jump up and say something as well. But, um, you know, just very quick survey. So some of you have used Scratch as a language. Some of you used Alice. Some of you have used Python. Some of you used Java. C Sharp. Uh, C. C++. Um, 
What have I left out? BB. BB, oh, Visual Basic. Yeah, okay. Uh, anything else? Emacs list. Yes, Emacs list, absolutely. Um, <laughs> actually, actually, I think it was on the, there, there is at least one person in New Zealand using that in classes. In fact, I think I know who it is. <laughs> Someone who uses Sorry? Someone who uses Pearl as well. Pearl. Oh, yes, Pearl. Yes, big shout out for Pearl. Um, and there's. Um, and, and, and I just put this whole session by. So, so the idea of the session is that you just get to see what on earth these languages look like. Actually, for a very quick look at what on earth these languages look like, we've got these posters and we've got the same program written in eight different languages. Um, so some of the speakers might even want to start with this and explain why this example here isn't a particularly good example of their language because it's much better than what's on here. Um, and, but but it, it's, although we do get quite hit up about these things, um, realistically computer scientists feel good about knowing lots of languages and using the right language at the right time for the right sort of purpose and all that sort of thing. Um, but it can get quite heated, so who knows what will happen. Um, the, my general advice is that if you're passionate about a language and you know it really well and you're confident as a teacher, then that's the language to use. Okay? Um, so, although people will probably be pushing for different languages and things like that, uh, in the end, being confident is really important. Another really important thing is, are there good resources for teaching it? Now, if you know the language super, super well, you might not need any resources anyway. Um, but the languages that are widely used for education, um, like Java, Python, Visual Basic, Alice, Scratch, I mean, they, they, they're taught in thousands, if not millions of places around the world. Um, there are heaps of online sites and books and textbooks and text, you know, things that give examples. So that, that uh, particularly if you're new to it, that will be a very important consideration. Um, and part of that will be peer support as well. A lot of people in your region using, um, so I've mentioned, for example, in Waikato, um, C Sharp is hugely popular and it's probably a good one to use if you're in that region because you get lots of support in that language and the local university uses it. Um, and oh, by the way, um, I did a quick check on all the university websites this morning. So, um, Otago uses in the first year? We use both Python and Java, but Java is a continuing language. Right. Okay, so you can learn Python, not continue Java, and continue. It's going up the country. Canterbury, we use Python in the first year, and then we teach Java in the second year. Um, like uh, Victoria, they use Python in the first year, as best I could tell. Oh, 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 Java, sorry. Why don't you tell me they use Java? Java, okay. Um, oh, sorry, Messi used Python, and Auckland used Java. Now, another thing is, are you... Um, is, does it help for a student to know the language of the university that they're going to? I mean, Tegan said yes, that was, that was useful. Um, though, quite frankly, again, knowing what programming is is probably the most useful thing, so it's not that important in my view, but um, that's, that's another consideration as where they're heading. Um, another consideration people often have when they choose a language is, is it used in industry? Um, that is arguably not a good reason to choose a language, um, and you would never use Alice or Scratch, for example, anyway. Uh, and but most of the other languages you can find plenty of industry people who use them, so you can justify any language by saying it's quite used in industry anyway, except No, no, you're just undercutting my Java argument. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> except Java is much more widely used. Yes. Yeah. Python. Python's only used by small companies like Google and Yeah, the Python thing that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, that's true. Yeah. Oh, right. If they can do one language, then you go to use another one, have you messed with their head? Yeah. Um, in my view, no. In fact, if, if anything, you're exposing them um, to. Uh, I mean, we seriously, our graduates will probably know six languages by the time they leave um, because you want them to know all the different ways of attacking a problem and approaching it and that sort of thing. Um, and so, with a lot of what we've been doing, seeing two of something is actually a really good idea. You know, looking at two compression methods or looking at two ways of representing characters. Like if you've only seen ASCII, then it's easy to think that's the only way. As soon as you've seen two ways, you, you, you realise that maybe there's a variety of things out there to, to consider. So um, I, I actually see it as a bit of a positive. Yeah. There's another argument with that, um, in that. I've heard it from teachers talking about actual um, spoken languages and stuff. And um, when I, and this happens a lot, with the, when you take a second language, you learn much more in depth about how yeah. your natural language, your first language is put together. And like, I didn't understand what a verb and a noun was until I actually took French. So 
So, so it's the same with, with languages. Obviously, your first one's going to be your primary language that you're most understanding with. But anything that adds to it will be just simply adding to your basic knowledge. So having a wide breadth of, of languages means that you've got a very good understanding of your base language yeah. and computing as well. So I think it's important to understand that uh, in computer science you have a toolbox, which is what you use to get that stuff. And if all you have in the toolbox is a hammer, then you probably get all those jobs done. But they're not always going to be that pretty. Yeah. So sometimes you have to and, and then, just to close that off, the, when they leave school, then all we want is them to appreciate what computer science is, what programming is, not to be fluent in five languages or something like that. If they are, fine, but they're probably we're doing it at the expense of something else. We, we definitely select for people that are uh, going to be in general. Computer science languages are like really fetish, like, you know, like say it's always quite long or it'd be like something else.
he does ornamentally, and he goes through, and he actually deals with both Python and Java. So I start off with this, and I say to them, okay, that's what all languages will have. When you write your program, um, you've got two kinds. You will have the batch program, which just goes from start to end, or you're going to have event-driven <coughs> one. And I said, in the end, the event-driven one comes back, well, I'll stop it, it comes back to this, oh, I need some of those mouses that are just about, um, that whatever you're going as an event, it does come back to that sort of linear program. This action, this event, what's your action? It's going to be that little bit there. So it just kind of possibly puts a bit of context within. So why do Scratch? Well, I suddenly decided at the beginning, not the beginning of the year. Um, April, I knew I was going to do Scratch because I did tens of actually been introduced to it. And I thought, okay, go from the known to the unknown. So we started off and I thought, mm, I'm not going to let the language dictate to me. I um, just had this moment because I was thinking, oh, I've got to do all these games, I've got to do all the sound, I've got to do all this stuff. And I thought, no, 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 go back to basics. Let's just teach them programming principles. So, much to their horrors, I remember when they started off with, oh, we're going to learn, we're going to learn. Well, you're going to learn programming principles. First principle is how does a computer talk to you? So, right, how does a computer talk to you? Output. And I made sure I was using the terminology. For some of them, it was how do you adjust to that one? To see it right. I mean, obviously, first we'll tell them what the whole screen and everything all about. But first of all, output. All programs have output in that how does a computer communicate with you? And in Scratch, basically, the first kind of output was text. So where does it come from? The output comes from the looks bar. And with the looks bar, it's the say and all the bits there. It's what's actually going to happen on the screen. So I said, most of the looks is going to be kind of output. What is it going to communicate to you? And then I go through quite a few little programs, just going through all of this over here. Then the next concept that they need to have is, um, put it here, is variables. We bring in this idea of variables and expressions. So where does that all come from? We're looking at variables, we're looking at operators, and um, we then have some discussion about all of those things, what are random, what are these operators, the comparisons. We haven't touched on any of this yet, um, but we look at operators, variables, and I'll try to show them that we come from different places. At this stage, it was just set to the exposition of the sprite, so right, let's move our sprite, let's run it, and it actually comes up. And it, when we start off with, um, I said when they declare the variables, if they want to make a variable, I always make sure they go for the sprite only, that at the time I'm saying keep it local, keep it with the variable that you're working with, they don't have to know about local globals yet, but I'm getting them into a habit. This is what I'm, I'm a big one on this habit. I mean, this is just me, this is how I like to do it. So make sure it's for this sprite only, so it will be sprite one, etc. And I haven't got around to giving the sprite a name, which I should have done, but anyway. Um, then this up on the screen the whole time, which is part of the debug, which is kind of what they're learning at the same time. What's actually happening in memory? Um, and that's what you can get across to them there. So he's got that there. If I move my sprite around and we run it again, and I always tell them stop before you start, because otherwise it could be running on something else. So stop and then we start. It's just habits we need to get into that. Um, and they can see where those numbers come from and where it goes. The next concept is how do we get input? And um, input will come from, and you'll probably say that I'm going to be my input, my input, here we go. Um, in my folder, just by the way, I'll just show you the basic that I have. I'll just go back to, and I'm going to find out where I am at the moment. Go back a step here, go back a step there. Um, you'll see that when I go my um, <coughs> approach to Scratch, I have input and output. I have heaps of programs. Basically, what I do is I say, right, we're going to code this one in, and I get them to code. I do not give them the program. I want them to type it in or pull out the little boxes or do the whole thing that they have to do. So it's all the way over there. So if I come back to here and I look at the input ones, um, input basically, what's the first kind of input? Input will come through text. So we talked about this. And they hopefully get into the habit, you always ask the question. Tell them get two hats on, you've got to have the programmer's hat, the user's hat. Programmer knows what's happening in the background. User doesn't see that, what does user see? Make it user friendly. So that hopefully get into this habit. They've got to ask the question and have this variable set to what their variables are. So we do a whole lot on input. There are other inputs as well. 
um, from the sensing, they would have some inputs, I've got a whole lot of other ones there, where you can have input from the key press, you can have input from sliders, you can have input from whatever else here, um, and then we'll then get that. So that one will give you your input statements. We then go on to, and then I'll give them a tutorial, and all I'm looking at is sequential structures. Input, processing, output, and then a whole lot of questions on that. That's all they have to do. Then we go on to um, selection. So if I come back to where I was here, and put up this one here, branch selection. I'm just going to put one at random and take this one here. Before we do this, of course, we do a whole lot of looking at what does this actually mean, and we talk about. Now, this is one of the disadvantages of Scratch: is that there is no greater than or equal to. You actually have to use an AND statement for that. So it's going to be this greater than that and this equal to that or this equal to that can be both. So it's this or that. I actually have to do the two statements. By the way, when we do the output, um, when they're going to convey something, we do quite a lot with the join. So they do a little bit of character handling here. So you never just give a number. Never just give a number as an output. Put it in a context. What is it? Is it an age? Is it a percentage? Is it a temperature? What is it? Put it in context. With a computer, it's a number. For the human being, they want to know what it is. So they learn this bit here about join something to something. So you'll see that when we do this here, say the numbers are equal, say something, and put it on output there. What they're working out here under the control structures is what I call a subliminal message in terms of that when you use these control structures, everything inside is indented. So it's in that block structure, which is important. <coughs> so we do quite a lot of those as well. Right, once you've done your branch selection, another whole lot more of questions, using questions that are just using that one. We then go on to the loop structures. So we go back to here. Loops. And we do a huge amount of them too. So I'll just jump to one here. <coughs> right, in this particular one, <coughs> there, example to illustrate the loop statement. In this one, I was bringing in this idea of different threads, but also um, I was trying to show them that I'm not sure why Scratch actually <coughs> had this for the loop. Um, I've shown them how it works, but I said one thing you've got to remember is that you can't build further onto this forever loop. And the only way you're going to stop it is to push the stop button. And I said, to be quite honest, I don't think that's good programming. That's just me. You shouldn't have to have a program where you have to stop it. The program should stop through some other means. But anyway, actually, this is there, so by all means, if you want to use it, it's something I love it. They have things that you can do all the time. That's fine, but what, what's it all for? So we then go on further into what I think are the better um, loop ones, which is your four loops and your repeat tools. The repeat until, and again, um, the different conditions. I've shown them all the different conditions we have here. So in this particular one, I just did it with a <coughs> drawing tool. Basically, what is he doing? He's just moving around. So he's going to repeat until he's touching the edge. And then it will stop drawing and then I'll put the high. But basically, I'm just looking at this construct. I want them to get used to that construct. And again, subliminal message, it's inside, it's indented. You can see all of this is going to be your repeat loop. Once I've done all of that, what do we then do? I'll then go back and I'll do what I call the mini algorithms. These are bits that occur in any number of ways. Find an average. Use a counter, what's a maximum, what's a minimum, higher student, lower student, oldest person, whatever. But those are what I call little mini algorithms. And um, that bits of code that occur all the time. So I let them do some of those as well. And then we do a whole lot of worksheets on that one. And in essence, what I've just covered is all I really need in level one. That's what I was doing in my year 13s to do 18741. Everything I did in the first two would be all of that. So in fact, a lot of the questions I've taken from my year 13 program as well, because it's the same sort of thing all the way through. So it's getting them to a comment, it's getting them to think things out, it's getting them to use the right structure and to think, what is my input? What's my output? What are my variables I'm going to use? Declare them first. Put the first comment in is all that sort of thing. So hopefully I've got them into good programming principles. 
comment your work, think it through first before you code, etc., etc. Now next year, year 12, I'm going to do Python. One of the beauties of doing Scratch, there's no syntax to worry about. All the code is there for them, so they don't have to worry about syntax issues. But the disadvantage is they don't get any error messages. So next year when we do it in Python, hopefully they've got these principles so far. So all they're really learning is a new syntax. It's a new code. That's all it is. But they're going to have to think now, if I want to loop, I'm actually going to put the code in myself. And if I'm using a comma or a semicolon or whatever, it's going to give me an error message. So that's the next bit of learning they're going to have to do. So I will go through the same things again next year, the first four to five weeks. I reckon I should be able to cover it because I've already done some of the constructs here. Then I'll go on to um, probably give them the 9176 as a practice one. Say, so, right, you've done it in scratch, now you do it in Python, and hopefully they can do it again. Then I will do character handling because I think it's quite important that I know how to do some string handling. Mm -hmm. Plus, it's a great way for indexed data structures. If you're doing characters, it's an indexed data structure in Python. And it also gives them an introduction to functions with um, thinking about what a function actually is because they're going to be doing character handling functions. Then go on to some lists, which is the array structure. Um, I'll also do very shortly the input output text files because it's a great way for entering a lot of data for testing. And then we'll go on to the procedures that they will actually have to define. And that should take me the first two tools next year, plus doing some hardware in the background. What are we going to do in year 13? One major project, and I'm still thinking about it. Probably what I will do then is to do the GUI with Python. Just by the way, there is Python GUI, you have to have to think to Kinta to do that, which really only works at 2.7, don't move to 3.1, um, or you can even do the Python games. Python is great because you can use it as just text based, you can use it as object, you can use it for GUI, and there are so many resources out there. So it's really great. So for me, it was scratch just to get them into programming principles, and it's a great language for them. Thanks. <laughs> Version. 
quite disappointing. You know, just start from scratch again. I'll actually come through. But um, that's really what they And they actually do appreciate and they did learn that. And I must say, all well, honestly, um, between Blair and I, we had 75 students. I would say we had some pretty good results out of the 75 students. So they're down to three. Any other questions? Um, look, I love what you said, but you should see the little bit past. I'm sorry, I'm the South African racehorse. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's this online anyway. Is it on the insect? No, this is all my own stuff. But, but, um, but I'm just interested in the steps that you went through for years and then the steps mm -hmm. that you wanted to go, you know, the programming. Yep. And, and I just think it was good to get That's fine. Yeah. I, I can have a check with you, and I, as I said, okay. I can share with you. Really, not a huge Yes. Oh, I'm intrigued as to how you dealt with the sort of kids that I get who would turn their noses up at Scratch as being not a real programming language. And how did you, and you alluded to it when you said that they wanted to know what they were doing at the beginning of the year. Did they actually buy in and realise that it was concepts and that it doesn't matter about the language? And that's, that's a really good point there because there were one or two who come in and they, oh, they know it all, you know, they, they know it all. Um, but after about the first couple of lessons, when I kept saying, well, what's your input? What are your variables? What's your output? In other words, using the formal terminology, they, I think, began to realise, hey, I might know code, but I don't know programming. Um, and it, it's, it's that kind of the, um, but yes, they did buy in. And actually, a lot of those kids eventually got my excellences because they then could see, oh, yeah, we need to do all of this before we get into that. And they really got on to it. One of the things I'm sad I couldn't do this year is with all the stuff happening in Christchurch, my year 11's lost 25% teaching time, just how it happened. So I didn't actually have time to go back and do some more of the project orientated stuff, do some of the bells and whistles stuff, because I said to them, look, get your program working first, before you put all the bells and whistles in the sound and colour it in different stripes and so on. Because that is actually the fluffy stuff. I said, make sure it's working first. I didn't have time to go back and say, right, now put some of the fluffy stuff in and make it look pretty. Um, but I know Blair had a really good one going in the background. I just want to explain quickly what you've got your kids doing as an ongoing in the background, a chessboard. Oh. And they um, love that. Yeah, that's what I was uh, a little task for the students to uh, use the sprite to create a, a, a checkerboard. Um, and it started off that they could just create a, a, an 8x8 normal chessboard. Uh, could they give a sprite to actually repeat? And so it's loop within loop, create a chessboard, and obviously alternate them again, and then uh, modify it so that they could uh, generate a chessboard of any dimension. So get them to try and work out when are they switching the pen colour back, when are they having to solve it. Is it the first time that every new line, alternating colour, so quite, quite a vibe, and once that sort of worked on that, um, worked out very soon that uh, they ended up with, you know, a bit of a stripe chessboard if they didn't get their uh, toggling right. Um, it was good. Good one for the, but, for the kids. Yeah. Look, just take a moment comment from Josh and then we'd better move on because sure. we've got a few more images. Sorry, just very quickly, so I really like the uh, emphasis of Kettle on testing. So, um, especially now, um, uh, unit testing is way more like mainstream. It's much more important that the code is correct. I'm going to run my business on it, or you know, your code is going to be used to run it on call or something. The point that code is like really, really, really kind of great. It's not like, oh, I just write it and you know, it looks like it's good enough. Like, it actually has to be right. So, um, I like that other emphasis. Oh yeah, 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 and that's one of the one things when they do their planning is that they actually have to give me test data and yep. that before you even write your code, tell me if you put this in, what are you going to get out? Think for yourself what you're going to get out. You must just get a number and think it's it's okay. Is it the right number? Right. So that's part of what, but that I also learned a lot when I, just from teaching it from that man as well. Yeah, but like it's build, building it so that it's testable is also yes. an important thing that you can get Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, th thanks Mona. Um, so I think I've invited a couple more random people to, to talk about languages. We've sort of just got about five or ten minutes each, and it's just really just a, a taste, you know, just to give a taste for people. Who would like to go next? Yep, great, thanks, Ron. I don't know whether I can show this on the machine. Uh, I was going to talk Visual Basic. Yep, um, do you want the, we've got a, what sort of interface do you need? Yeah. A black browser or a... Um, do you have PB loaded at all? In I which case, if you don't, I'll just talk by right. raising my arms. Okay, uh, no, the, um, the, we've got a visual the, here. Oh. <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> um, 
the few things that I wanted to say about Visual Basic are um, the software you use needs to be free for the students to use so that they can load it at home. So Python fits, um, Java, Scratch, and with the Visual Basic you can get a free version for the students. The download's very big, so it's best to get it and put it onto CDs which you can distribute for the, the students to take home. Um, the second thing is that I am not crazy about text-based only um, because that's not what students see when they use a computer. They're not used to seeing um, you know, the run command screen or text only output. And although we're, we're teaching programming, it feels too foreign to them if that's you know, what they see. If they see buttons and um, slide controls and you know, list boxes and so on, that's much, much more familiar territory for them and it's easier to then get them to realise that actually everything they're using on a computer, someone wrote a program that put those things on the screen and, and there must be code sitting in behind that does things. Um, and the next reason why I think something like Visual Basic is useful, and you can see obviously this applies to other things as well, is that the interface that you have when you're writing programs um, decreases the amount that the students have to remember in terms of what commands are and, and what the um, what they can do simply by you know putting a, an opening bracket and it'll give you the list of parameters which are legal at this point in time or you know put in a full stop and it will come up with a list of choices of things that you can do next. So there's less memory involved in terms of what options students can choose at any particular point in time. Um, things which I find difficult with Visual Basic are uh, when you're doing um, entry, all entry is treated as text, and if you want to restrict things to being numeric, so if I want an integer value only, that in fact becomes quite tricky. And for those things, I always go to the internet, grab code, chuck it into the program and say someone else has worked out how to do this so it you know, makes your data entry fit numeric patterns and we will use this code and we may not even understand it. In other words, things that I think should be built into the language aren't and they need to be sort of done by an extra section of code. I don't know whether I've said enough or whether there are any questions. Cool, that was less than five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, C sharp, I think. Are you going to say something about that? Yeah. Yeah? Is that cool? Well, it's easy to hear from the front. It's to get that to work. 
and then you would grab the pin and you had to identify where the place was on the map as quickly as possible and pop the pin in and then you link that to a high score system on the website. So <coughs> you kind of integrate a whole lot of stuff just in one pocket. You have different students working on different aspects of it. So some people helped create the, uh, they did 3D models of the pin heads with the lies on them and things like that. Um, another project we did for TechEd was uh, instead of just doing random projects, we usually do clients. So we had to do one with Baldwin's intellectual property lawyers. And so the boys had uh, three sprites of themselves down on the bottom of the screen. And then they had to create a random thought generator. And the thoughts would come up in the thought bubble. And they'd float up. And the Baldwin's bear had to try and capture those thoughts before the IP bandit popped down the stole the ideas. <laughs> but, but it was just a basic 2D kind of game. But it gets them thinking about what they have to do to meet a client's brief and that sort of stuff. And there's also a lot of programming knowledge that goes into that. And they, uh, like it seems crazy, like we, we don't start off with doing the basic stuff. We just jump in the deep end and then try and figure it out as a group. We have a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring system, so they help each other. And one of our best programs is Year 9, so we have got some of the older kids. Um, and it just seems to work. Like, by the end of last year, we'd done it for 12 months. And at that point, they could all sit down as a group and say, OK, let's make a few games. And they could organize themselves into teams. They'd have a nominated project manager who would uh, organized the project and they used the Scrum project management system. So we had uh, Claris IT coming in to teach them that stuff. And uh, they could just make games without any guidance whatsoever. So it's worked really well for us. And yeah. Um, next year we're going to try and put these standards into that model. So we're going to work with John Glashen College in Dunedin because they're almost the exact opposite of unlimited. So it's going to be really interesting to try and marry those two things together. But Colin and I have come up with some, some really cool ideas to actually get some of those things working. So yeah, that'll be interesting. So that's how we use C-sharp. And it's mostly because we've got a lot of support from industry. Uh, but Intergen and people like that, when we were in town, we could just run around the corner to Intergen and say, how do we do this? So all that kind of stuff. And when you do that, you can actually get the different teams getting all the other kids to test their projects as they go. So we used to have testing afternoons on Fridays where they'd play each other's games and say, oh, this isn't working. Abuse each other. And, <laughs> that was quite yeah. and it gives them incentive to try and make games quickly because they actually just want to play the games. So, yeah, that's what we do. Cool. So you're very much using a, um, a peak based practice model rather than just a, um, a, a programming model?
tell them that class and they can't choose the class and they are or not the night. But most of them say I have the night, but it's not in my hands. Hey, thanks very much. And uh, you know, again, to me, I guess you have uh, Java on that. Yeah, I'll think about Java. Um, I'll, I'll have to dissemble slightly because the truth, Java probably isn't the language that I would choose as a first teaching language, even though it's the one I teach at the University of Otago. But I will outline the advantages of Java as a first year teaching language. As Tim said, industry, industry standards, some languages really are, and Java really is. Uh, there's probably more jobs advertised for Java than other languages uh, still. What is really useful about Java is that if you start with it, it's a language you can follow on to almost anything. There are so many ways of extending and using Java. Uh, you can pick up the libraries that let you do web-related stuff. You can pick up the libraries that let you do databases, uh, secure interactions with databases, cryptography versions of Java for robotics. You start with Java, you've got a language that you can take right through to professional work in almost uh, any area. There's lots of libraries, lots of ways of extending it. It's part of the C-like family of languages. So when you learn Java, you're learning not just Java, but you're learning a whole lot of what you need to know about C, C++, C Sharp, uh, and in fact, all sorts of procedural languages which have basically the same kinds of constructs and, and ways of, of working. Um, in fact, if you, if you write Java programs with just one class and every member static, it's, it's quite similar to a C program. You don't have to deal with object-oriented concepts at all. You could use Java in year 11 and 12 uh, without ever mentioning objects and object-oriented programming. You just say, well, everything's got to be static. It's just this one class that wraps up the program. It's a nice balance of power and discipline. Java's a powerful language. But it's also a disciplined language. It's got strong types, which, for example, Python doesn't. Python's a bit wobbly than types, in my opinion. Uh, and that lets you make some points about teaching in a stronger way. Uh, and it imposes a certain discipline on the program, which prevents some kinds of errors. That's not the point. It's got balanced checking on arrays, which again rules out common kinds of error. And it's built to be safe in the way that you have to manage memory. You don't have to get as hands-on with memory as you do in C and uh, C++, uh, because you've got garbage collection instead of the uh, automatic garbage collection instead of the manual allocation and deallocation of memory. Uh, and you've got pointers, which have most of the power that you want, become references in Java, most of the power of pointers without the, the horrendous messes that programmers can get themselves into with pointers in other languages. So it's a good balance of power and discipline uh, that we've got in Java. Its um, graphics and event model is kind of nice. It's consistent. It just fits in with all the other con concepts if you do, if you get into the object-oriented side of Java. Some languages, graphics is an add-on. It's a new package that you've got to learn. Uh, it's a new way of thinking. And it's a, it's a change of mental fears. If you've taken Java through to the object-oriented level, Graphics in Java works just, just the same. Here's a simple little graphics program that I use in one of my lectures. This is the application class. It's just boilerplate. We just need to, to run the thing. And all it does is it makes a red dot move in a window. Um, here's the actual class that does the work behind that, which builds a graphical user interface in a panel, which gets loaded in the window. Uh, and basically, we, we set up the size of the panel. And here's the bits that do the work. This is the method that draws the circle uh, of a certain size uh, and color. And this is the method which generates or responds to the events and updates x, which we use as the position to draw the thing. So x keeps getting bigger. And when x gets too big, greater than 150, we set x back to 20. And that makes the spot jump back to the start. Uh, so <coughs> just to run that again. Uh, so there we go, that's x changing every tenth of a second, a time is causing that uh, method to run and it updates x. And if x is too big, it's x back to 20. There are other things that we could do with x. Uh, we could use x to vary the color. So instead of having a color that's just red, we'll have a color that depends on the values of x, where colors are drawn <coughs> by numbers representing red, green, and blue balance. Uh, so if we, we compile that, and we rerun the application. 
now we've got x which is changing not only the position that the thing is drawn, but also the color that it's drawn in. Now we'll do one more change based on x. Uh, we'll change the size of the object. At the moment we're drawing at a certain position, an oval of width and height 30. Now we'll draw an oval of width and height x. Which will start at 20 and get bigger. And now we've got something which varies in position, size, and colour on the screen. And you know, this is this is your opening credit shots, it's your approach for Planet Wu Bini and your spaceship. All the big graphics programmers of Pixar and wherever else, Weta, they all start with this kind of stuff. Uh, you've got simple animation, and it's not that hard to do in general. So that's it. You've got to acknowledge the big limitations of Java 2. <coughs> you can't avoid a bit of old be this is magic, public static void, main, string out, uh, at the start. You can actually give a reasonable one sentence explanation of each of those keywords and then say, okay, now we'll move on. The other thing that really annoys me about Java as a feature is that input, it used to be input and output, they fixed output. Uh, input is more difficult than it needs to be, and um, you've got to actually write a method to even do something sensible like read an integer nicely from the keyboard. Uh, so that's a bit of a hassle, but if you can live with those hassles, Java on cell phones, Android devices, robots, dishwashers, you uh, name it. Okay, um, the, I was going to talk about Python. Are there any other languages that we need to cover? Yes. C++. C++. Yes. Yeah, right. okay. um, easy. Um, it seems to be quite uh, readable when you read it from, from a person who doesn't know programming. You can read or see out. You, you can sort of understand what it's doing. And my boys have actually found it rather easy. Um, at the end of year 13, they're usually um, doing networked uh, games, stuff like that. So they, they pick it up rather easy, really easy and they can just run with it. It's not graphical, well, not very easily graphical. Uh, so most of the stuff we do is console-based. Um, but I think it would be easy it's, for me, if you're teaching OO um, in year 13, um, it's easy to make objects and like make a bank account program or something like that, teach them procedure, you do it with objects. So for me, it's quite an easy choice. Um, I was trying to work out how you could do another, uh, what other language would be good for uh, object oriented at year 13. I can't really think of one, maybe Java would be the next choice. I was, you know, I'm, I'm still in the debating of do I keep doing C or do we jump to Java? Um, I've just only touched on Python just a little bit, so I'm not really sure exactly how that works. It, the data types is quite unusual. Yeah. Mm. In uh, Python, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's weirding me out a little bit. Um, 
Um, what else was good about C++? Um, I've noticed my boys also when we just started doing, uh, I started doing comparison languages and just showing them the difference between each one. They pick up um, other languages really fast. They can do, uh, you know, any any basically C language, Java. They can do Java usually. Um, yeah, I've, yeah. So I found it as a really, it, it's it, the point is not that, um, yeah, a bit nightmarish, and it does you do have to worry about memory allocation. Um, but we don't go into that too much anyway. Um, I do show them this is how you can make a data structure so you can use pointers. So break down an array and say this is pointing to that, and so they get the concept quite quickly. Um, but we don't actually you don't actually use it. It's use a library. So there are some different positives, but yeah, some nightmarish fun parts to this one. <laughs> But my boys uh, love it. They love it. They say it's. Uh, they, they, I asked them. They did the uh, Waikato University paper as well, and flew for it. And they said C plus plus. I said, which one do you reckon I should? Do you think I should switch, uh, switch to C sharp? They said, no, no. We love the C plus plus because it really helped us understand the concepts, and we cross over to C sharp, and now we know two languages quite well. So that was there. That was from them feedback on it also, because I was going to switch to C sharp because it was still a lot of cool unique. Yeah. Questions? What IDE is it? What IDE? Yeah. Um, we've been using uh, dev um, on the Windows side, um, but um, uh, next year it depends again on the language. I am tempted to go to Java, to be honest. So if I stay with C, um, I'm going to go to the Mac side and use Xcode or something like that so we can do like little devices and stuff. Yeah. So that'll be uh, Xcode or I might use code blocks or something from the Mac side. But dev C or uh, uh, Visual Studio we can do that sometimes as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs>
and things like that, which are all sort of considerations. Now, these colours are, are his opinion, but he's got arguments for why. So, you know, why people in education aren't using PHP. Few teachers have gone to understand that it's, fairly, it's a fairly popular language. There's, there's a good base of PHP programs around, but it's not used a lot in education, so you won't find textbooks. Um, but that, that, that does sort of go through a lot of the questions you might have, and there's, there's just so many things to think about when you're choosing the language. But uh, anyway, I can talk about Python, um, which obviously is sort of the new kid on the block. In fact, that, um, I've got to look up some statistics. There's a, there's a survey done last year. These are languages used in uh, Australian universities, and so in 2001, Java was really popular, and it still is very popular. Python really wasn't being used at all, but now you know, it's getting up to 20%. Uh, the, um, yeah, so, so um, Visual Basic, you know, quite a decline in what the universities are doing. And of course, that's just one of the considerations that you've got. But it, it does sort of give an idea of the scenario. So <laughs> Python very much is a new thing. There's new textbooks coming out for it now, but just in the last couple of years. Um, it's been around for a while, Python has got a strong culture, but the, one of the key things with Python is it's an interpretive language, and so you can get it going quite easily. In fact, this is a website called trypython.org, uh, which will run Python for you, so you just go to trypython.org and type a Python program into it. And, um, and, and because it's interpreted, you can just type in one line, in fact, you can type in one expression, 5 plus 2, and it runs that program, and the output of that program is 7. So you, um, and then you know, x equals uh, 5 plus 2, and print x, and so being interpreted, and, and this is one of the reasons people really like it, is that you can actually start from very simple building blocks um, and do very, very simple steps. And then after a while, students realize they actually want to repeat a lot of this stuff and put that into a file, um, and you're more likely to use a development environment, and again, they're, they're all free. Um, this is a particular one called Wing, uh, Wing, Wing 101. Um, um, and the, the way it works is it's, it's, it's got the interpret window down here, so again I can just you know, type in a program straight away and have it run. Um, or I can put the program up here. X and run the program and it happens down the bottom there. So very natural transition from putting in one of commands there. Um, it does have this thing um, called dynamic typing. So Java and, and the other languages tend to be statically typed, which basically means you have to say in advance that X is going to be an integer and if you try and do anything about else with X then it's throw an error. Um, in Python you just say, oh, I think I'll make up a variable called uh, Fred and I'll put um, the string into it, and now and Python says, oh, fair enough, that looks like a string, so Fred's now declared as a string variable. And you can only do string things with Fred, you know, by printing them out <coughs> and so on. Um, but the problem with, with this is because you're not declaring things, you can, you know, the next line I could say, you know, Fred equals 5, and I've spelled it wrong, and, it, and there's no problem with that. It just says, oh, you've got a new variable, and so spelling mistakes, you know, don't get spotted so easily. The compiler doesn't help you quite as much to spot that. Um, and that's one of the downsides of dynamic typing. You say, oh, you want one of those? Yeah, sure, you can have it. Um, <laughs> so, um, and, and the, the Python programs tend to be fairly concise and simple. Um, I just dug up this quick page. This is a Caesar cipher in Python. Um, so, just uh, it's, it's got a, a bunch of characters and it looks up something in the characters and adds the, the, key, uh, the key to it. And, the thing out and so on. Um, actually, the so in fact here's the here's the entire decryption program. Um, so basically, given a key and given a particular message, um, this is the for, for for every character in the message. So this, this is very not great Python program, by the way. Um, if if it's not in here, then just skip it. Otherwise, look it up and subtract the key from it and put that in the output. Okay, so that's kind of what a program looks like, and in fact if we run that, um, that is the encrypted message that I had up before, and we'll run it, and it's printing out every possible decryption um, using all the different possible keys, and number 10 turns out to be the, 
the one that makes sense. So that was a brute force attack on a cryptographic system using Python programming. Um, but it, the reason it's sort of very popular for scripting and so on is that you can actually, it, it's got built-in stuff for doing very powerful things. So we could say, uh, for instance, we could have uh, what, what's called a dictionary, um, which I'll set up, uh, and you can index, you know, string. So, whoops, the address of Tim is Christchurch. So that looks like an array. An address of and then so if I just ask for the address of Max, uh, comes back with whatever that value is. So normally in, in a program in a language like C, you would end up writing loops to go searching through and all that sort of stuff. But the reason it's quite popular. Um, for web applications and so on, tools like that too, right? It, it's, um, you, it just does a whole lot of stuff that you often want to do in one line and it does it all for you. Of course, computer scientists will say, well, you have to know actually behind that, it's actually how is it looking those things up? Is it doing a linear search going through every single one or is it, is it doing a, a, a more sensible search? As it happens, it's doing a more sensible one but most of the time. Um, so, um, but very easy to, to do fairly powerful things. So that's what Python looks like. Um, this environment is called Wing 101. It's available for free um, from wingware.com. Yep, uh, yep. yep. Um, so nearly every language that's been talked about is available on Windows and Mac and uh, usually uh, Unix and Linux as well. Uh, the Visual Studio stuff is, is uh, Visual Basic. And so on. There's a little bit of cross platform stuff that happens with that. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, any quick questions about Python or comments? Because so. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's just something that you can comment on sort of languages. Um, I don't know, uh, I, I don't think I saw any examples of the exception being in any language. Ah, good point. Uh, is that a, a consequence of the way you've done your research? Because, I mean, obviously, in a, in a practical part, in a significant practical part, yeah, actually, I think I saw an example yesterday with uh, try yeah, try yeah, with try and so on. Um, so, I mean, most, I think most, if not all, have got some sort of exception handling. Whether that's something you teach at the introductory level, maybe not. I think, do you need to understand it's great for the input validation, the illegal boundary and protected inputs? The, the try catch stuff is really useful. So, it was in my examples yesterday, example level from programs, the excellence level Python program. Uh, use a, a try accept condition to evaluate whether the input is negligent. Um, and one other related thing is too, um, nearly all of these things have got GUI interfaces that you can bang onto them and so if you think that GUI is a good way to teach then you can get it for the Python and you can get it for Java and so on. It's kind of hard with Java, isn't it? One of the things that I've had choosing a language is that, you know, the Java ones have got so much stuff at the beginning that you just have to give kids to know and the research that I looked at has said that girls don't like that, boys don't mind, they want, as long as it works and does something, I'm happy with it, and if you tell me that's what I need, then I'll put it in and I'll do it. And the research I read was that girls like to know every line of the code, so a language like Python or Perl that doesn't have quite so much that you would give them, you're forced to use it at the beginning, is supposedly, I know mean, maybe the girls can correct me or not, but it makes it more accessible to girls if you can explain every line and they understand what it works. Yeah, I'm, I teach skills only, and I do do a lot of this goblin gook is just there and ignore it. You know, when we've done quite a bit, we can go back and look and explain it. But just for now, that's what you need. Um, and they're okay with that. Yeah, and they're okay with that. You know, um, there's lots of disappearances at that time, that time, and that time, and if you're doing any graphics output, and things like that. Okay, so they're gone. Okay. It seems that without the typecasting, that um, the potential for errors not to be identified seems to be larger. I like the, um, the C sharp, especially because it's strict. Yeah. And that syntax provides security, which means that you can get good error messages straight away that usually tell you exactly what the problem is. Yeah, although well, it's also a bit like the training wheels thing. If you're not wearing 
you know, knee pads and stuff, then you're a lot more careful about what you do. So there's advantage in both ways. And I mean, we, a lot of people teach using this, and I, I think maybe they can tell me better, but it, it's not a massive problem, it's just another thing to be aware of. Um, in Perl, you can turn on a warning, so it will say things like, if you typed in Fred with double E by mistake, it'll <coughs> program the work, but before it runs, if you turn on the warning, it'll say, you use the variable Fred only once. Are you sure it wasn't a typing mistake? So it, it still does that. Yeah. These programs can still do that sort of stuff. They just keep working without it. I want to ask a question about the tasks, programming tasks that are assigned. Text-based tasks, formula calculations tend to be a bit boring, whereas graphic output is more interesting, particularly for my students anyway. So I'd like to comment on the types of tasks okay. that are and which, right. which languages would be better for a more graphic task. Types of tasks. Actually, I might, might not go there just yet because we're a bit late for lunch, um, and we haven't even talked about pool. Um, uh, yeah, Pearl's got a lot in common with Python, basically. Um, but, I mean, just very briefly, all of these things can have graphic backends on, put on them of some sort. I think practically will. Um, so it's more a matter of what type of tasks you want to do. And, um, but the other thing is, you know, something like crack the code and so on. I mean, it's not graphic, but it can actually be. A lot of this is how you sell it. Um, Sitting with Scratch, I've seen people say, um, you know, my class think that it's baby stuff and they won't touch it. And other people say they absolutely love it. And it's, it's partly a matter of how you condition them and what they're expecting from that as well. Um, so probably a good thing to talk about over lunch anyway is, is what kind of tasks you use. But I think a lot of it's more to do with the culture you generate as much as what the tasks are. Um, then, I mean, it's, you know, it's been pointed out, it's really nice to have a GUI because people can relate that to actual, you know, oh, this is the actual sort of thing that you write Microsoft Windows and something like that. Yeah. Tim, is that program up on the exact somewhere? Uh, not that one, no. no. Because that will be quite cool, because one of the selling points for the yeah. space is um, I'm going to show you how to hack a, um, a crypt yeah. using a computer. Yeah. There you go. We, we, we should put it up, actually. Uh, Josh, you Sorry, I, think I, I uh, I'll, uh, I won't spoil it just yet, because I'll present it afterwards, but um, uh, do we know the interactivity? I'll, I'll leave it there. Ah, thank okay. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, cool. Um, hey, thank you very much to all the presenters for that. We'd better go and grab some lunch, because then we're going to be back at... What time? 12.55, we might make it one-ish. It has decided to give us a five-minute spiel on this bill. One minute. So I'm the only bill programmer right now, but I still want to tell you why I've chosen to do bill. If we look at the CSS over here, when we've got a um, heading one, the stuff inside the squiggly brackets is everything to do with heading one. If we look at um, PHP scripts, which is where I think the media and the programming is going together really nicely. If X is greater than 10, the stuff inside the squiggly brackets is everything that we do if X is greater than 10. And so this logic of the squiggly brackets being all the stuff to do with the stuff above it is there in CSS, it's there in PHP, it's there in Perl. So the carryover is really, really nice. As well, the semicolon means this is the end of this statement and I'm about to start another statement. In PHP, this is the end of this statement, and I'm about to start another statement. And Perl has exactly the same thing. So I really like Perl because of the way it links into the next topic, and the next topic, and the next topic. So I can say, just like white space doesn't matter in HTML, white space doesn't matter in Perl, white space doesn't matter in MySQL, comments are important, they might be slightly different, but and it's always the same. So I can spend quite a bit of time teaching this, and then see it again and again and again. So that's one of the reasons why I do it. Um, so we just, what is the code look actually doing if it's not PHP? Is it, it is pretty much PHP. Really, really similar to PHP. Is it doing PHP's job? Like it's, it, it's very similar to Python. It's a text-based language. and. It was written by a guy who wanted to do reports very quickly. Um, and so it's, it's one of those quick and dirty scripting languages, really. Is it, is it for, like JavaScript? Is it client side or server side? Or? No, it's an interpreted. It's more like Python than anything else. <laughs> That's it's a, very it's very a interesting mix of walk, like shell expressions, like a little bit like C stuff. It, it is very literally a mixture of. 
regular expressions in it, it's got um, really easy system calls. Now if you want to hack something together um, to merge a lot of different bits and pieces together, I think Perl's really good for that as well. So one of my selling points is, you know, when you're at university and you're studying something else and you've got the output of your sampler of your, I know, your protein sampler and it's outputting a string of data, you can suck that data into Perl, then you can manipulate it and pop it out in another format that will be useful to you everywhere. So Very useful for writing for loop. Something that doesn't quite talk to something else, you can write a very small compact program that's just enough to make it like one tool. Yeah. And it links to PHP and it's got the same syntax as the others. It's a step on language. It's a, st it's a language, yeah. It is a language, but it's um, it's a good language as well for infrastructure geeks, you know. For I want to run through and ping every IP address, I'd probably write that in Perl because it, it's going to be there by default, it's already on the system, it can loop through this stuff really quickly. Thanks, Max. Yeah.